circles around, and I don't know. I tried some different things. This is a bit of a mess, to be honest. But it is what it is. So, anyway, we're going to be uh, working on the Feedback Loops series today. Uh, I'm going to start recording High Fantasy and Steampunk is Dead. Actually, I should go the other way around. Steampunk is Dead and High Fantasy back-to-back. -back. I'm going to be recording both of those, and then I'm going to be uh, putting all three of the first three, the Feedback Loop, Steampunk is Dead, and High Fantasy into one bundle, because that's already available in Kindle format, and that'll be like 13, 14 hours of audio that you could use one credit for. Or you can just, you know, get them piece by piece if you like them organized a little bit better that way, if you want all the covers, stuff like that, because, uh, yeah, you're not going to get all three of these beautiful covers um, if, you get the, if you get the bundle. But, I mean, they're audiobook covers, right? I don't know if you even care about that. Anyway, let me uh, let me look up Harmon's notes for for me. Um, he said he put them all in a Google Drive. So let me see if I can find that. By the way, any of you who are on Twitch, this is a Wednesday. And on Wednesdays, I give away audiobooks to anyone who requests them, the first five people to request them, uh, on the Twitch chat. So today, I'm obviously giving away copies of the Feedback Loop. This way. Copies of the Feedback Loop. And uh, What's up, Jason? Uh, I'm giving away copies of Stone Cold Bastards. And um, what was the other one? And Clan. Yep. Those three. Today. You know what? I'll give away Hell's Rejects as well, if you want to request it. Alright, let's see. Where's my shared stuff? Or wait, I think it's actually... I know where it is. It should be... Where... Where's the feedback loop folder? Is it the feed? Yeah, here it is. Okay, cool. Is it not going to work? I don't see anything in there. No, this is not fair. Doc, Rocket, Sophia, and Zedek. Okay. But I don't think this is his new... I don't think this is the one that he put up for me. Mm. I'm a little confused, to be honest, y'all. Well, let me pull out... the book... There it is. Um, and uh, I don't know, if for those of you who haven't listened to or read the original feedback loop, um, it's it starts off in a cyber noir world. Uh, it's a lit RPG. And it's about this guy, Quantum Hughes, who keeps waking up the same day over and over. Uh, every time he gets killed, it doesn't matter. He goes right back to the same, the same spot. And um, he starts the day all over again. Starts with the morning assassin jumping in the window, and he has to kill that guy in some creative way. Because, you know, after you die enough times, you have to pretty much entertain yourself by killing things in more entertaining ways. So anyway, <laughs> he kills him in a different way. He goes outside. He goes out of his hotel room. He goes to the lobby. He kills 
these six other assassins that all have weird British accents. Um, and he kills the doorman, he kills the chef. Uh, it, it's just all chaos. It's just all killing chaos. And um, the, the first book is him trying to figure out how to get out. And um, eventually, spoilers, sorry guys, he does. And presumably the rest of the series is him trying to help other people who are stuck in other uh, virtual worlds escape. Um, so this technology is very complex and sometimes people can get can get stuck in however you know however way they 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 uh, they screw themselves up they end up trapped in their game worlds and him yeah he gets out sorry I didn't mean to spoil it for you guys but he he has to find he has to him and his team him and the dream team they're like this government um, this government agency that helps that helps people out of their uh out of their games so it's it's kind of like a an episodic thing and he's there's already six books available that Harmon's written like i said i'm about to record the next two two numbers two and three steampunk is dead and high fantasy and in both of those um he, he has to he's looking for missing persons so it kind of does keep that noir feel um even though even though steampunk is dead and high fantasy are based in different themed worlds um quantum pretty much keeps that noir chatter he kind of keeps that that noir way of speaking throughout the entire thing anyway so it keeps it because it's all mysteries missing persons mysteries and stuff it keeps that noir feel sort of throughout these different themes and it it gets pretty fun, but um, well, since I can't find the actual document that uh, I can't find the document that uh, what? Okay, Harmon's asking me what the deal is. I can't fi I can't figure out where the document is that you sent me for the rest of the characters. Um, I got high fantasy brief here dot doc. Oh, and I can't read it through my stupid through my stupid program here. So I gotta f try a different one. Crap. All right. So I need to look at our Facebook. We were just discussing which scenes I should do. And uh, I think book, I think chapter one of book three was one of them. There was a couple chapters that we talked about from the steampunk. Um, steampunk is dead one. There's lots of fun scenes. I mean, that's that's kind of what, like, Harmon's really great. Arc Darkwind? Is that... Is that you, Harmon, Ark Darkwind? I can't tell. Oh, there you are. No vid for you? Is anyone else having the no vid problem? Oh, what's up, Jay? Oh, that's right, Francis. Um, damn it, guys. Uh, so yeah, the it's it's saying it can't use the doc format. If you can put it in the Google Doc format, is anyone else having issues seeing it through Twitch? Yeah, it's not working, even on this program. So yeah, if you can put it in the in the Google Drive, in the Google Doc format, that'd be great. All right, so first what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a couple people uh, in real life.
for Harmon, uh, Harmon for Quantum, um, and <clears throat> excuse me. What's funny is just how much he acts like he still acts like his video game character because he's been in there for so long. Um, gosh, my iPad is slow. Everything takes forever to do it to do to switch around. Okay. Okay, so chapter four is good for steampunk, and I want you to guys to meet the steampunk Santa who sells them stuff. Not exactly sure which chapter that is. Damn it, guys. I wish I had had more time to prepare. This is what irks me about my show, or about myself, making the show not as good, is not having proper time to prepare before things. Because I'm always working on stuff right beforehand. Ugh. Haptic chair. This isn't the loop. I shrug as I make way up to the bed. Baltimore. Where are the cops, damn it? Jake and the fat man now. We already talked, we already saw, ah, man. Sorry guys, I'm having such trouble finding this stupid scene. That's what I'm thinking. I'm looking at chapter two and three and I can't find them. Okay. Okay, I think I I think I found it. We'll just start right here. Okay, so this is uh, this is Quantum. He's talking to Francis Euphoria. Um, she's kind of like his assistant in the in real life. She kind of, she's kind of like his handler. Um, uh, and she's telling him about the cops that are waiting to to talk to him about when he first woke up. And, like, there's some death and stuff when he first wakes up because someone's already trying to kill him in the real world. Um, so, here goes. She definitely handles him, yes. Uh, Francis is... Or, Francis. Uh, Quantum is... This, char this actor that I use for him is one of my favorites. I don't... Before this book, I didn't get to use him that often. 
Um, but it's great to narrate as him. Uh, I love his rhythm and just the kind of the the little bit of a East Coast accent and uh, the attitude, you know. Just a delight to narrate with. My eyes blur into focus, adjust to the cold light of the room. Some frou-frou melon-scented candle in the corner hints at a woman's touch. What happened? I ask Francis Euphoria, who is kneeling by my side. Morning Assassin will be here any minute. My finger comes up to access my inventory list. Start my day with war. End my day with suffering. Life in the loop. You can't do that here. She reminds me softly as she lowers my hand. Where am I? I ask through parched lips. My office. I look down to see my feet hanging off her couch, partially covered by a blanket. You were dreaming. Oh, shit. I press my palms against my eyes, hoping to rub the sleep out. Did I say anything? Dolly, she says. You kept calling her name. You should visit sometime. She'd be happy to see you. I need some Joe. Some grub, I say. When in doubt, change the subject. Francis is in a black uniform with a straight collar. A classy chassis, a hot body, smoking, the bee's knees. All describe the woman in front of me. It's hard to imagine I rescued her from a Proxima world based on, an, based on Arrakis when she was just sixteen. Time flies like mosquitoes, sucking the life out of everything. The agents are in the conference room, she tells me. I'll make a quick cup of coffee. For now, here's a Soylent bar. The dicks are here? You shouldn't call them that. Different meaning, I say, yawning. <sighs> well, same meaning in my case. You need to be on best behavior, she says as she hands me a rectangular bar wrapped in plastic. Unless you want trouble. My middle name is Trouble, I say with a smirk. Shut up and eat. A candy bar? It's not candy. It is made from soy butter, asparagus, pine nuts, coconut, spinach, raisins, and fiber. Sounds like squirrel food. I practically live off these things. They'll give you energy. I dangle the package by its tip above the floor. Come on, just eat it. I'll have breakfast, I'll have breakfast delivered as soon as the agents leave. Deal? Deal. Bacon, eggs over easy. Three slices of toast, pancakes, syrup, extra butter, and beer. We good here? Fine, but only one beer and a small one at that. You really shouldn't be drinking. Francis? Quantum, eat. I sit up, wincing at the reminders of the last 48 hours' festivities. One look around her office tells me that the Dream Team is indeed overfunded. Everything is old, beat up, cast off, third hand, the metal desk is scratched and dented and rusty in spots. No two of the mismatched file cabinets are the same size or color. The desk chair was old and beat up when I The desk chair was old and beat up when I went into the dye vat. It's torn vinaldehyde. Vine vinyl hide? I said vinaldehyde. It's torn vinyl hide upholstery is a mystery color that does not occur in nature. There's a makeup bag sitting on the desk. Knock off, a knockoff glossy as a fe a knockoff glossy as a fiend's eyes. It reminds me of the loop. I feel right at home. Hold on, Harmon's talking to me here. Hmm. He lost the docks. So, I guess Harmon, you're just you're just gonna have to give me direction on the characters in the chat, or on the Facebook, uh, the Facebook Messenger. Whichever one works for you. Say, say, how are you able to put me up in such a swanky hotel? I ask her. No offense, Francis, but this place would give shitholes a bad name. Thanks. The federal corporate government has a contract with the hotel. That's how. Now eat. The FCG is fronting the bill? In that case, we should order some room service tonight. Maybe. She nods at a dry cleaning bag. 
She nods at a dry cleaning bag hanging from her coat rack. Put that on. It's your uniform. The agents are in the conference room, two doors down on the left. I'll brew you some coffee. Got it. I, f I stuffed the soylent bar in my mouth. And remember to mind your manners. I always do, I say, speaking with my mouth full. One more thing, she says. What's that? Keep last night's air rage incident to yourself, okay? We have to be careful who we speak to. At least right now. Why right now? I ask. Just trust me. There are bigger forces in play than just the Revco and Reapers. FCGI, did I say something wrong? That's not what it says. It's not what it says, Harmon. Let's get this over with. I'm sitting across from Jake and the fat man now, trying to work the soylent crap out of my teeth. The conference room has enough room for an oval table and half a dozen mismatched chairs. Metal blinds separate it from the rest of the Dream Team office space. There's a diagram of an envy visor on the wall behind the table and a single fluorescent light above us. Other than that, the room is empty. Mr. Hughes, the first agent says. I'm Special Agent Reynolds, and this is Special Agent O'Brien. We're with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Intelligence Gathering. FBI IGs, huh? FBI IGs. Got it. Agent O'Brien is the older of the two, a fat man with a floral necktie, frayed collar, and food stains on his rumpled, two sizes too small sport jacket. His cheeks are littered with pockmarks and his nose would give Rudolph a run for his money. His body showcases the cumulative effects of long hours, bad nutrition, too much booze, and not enough exercise, like he's the display in the show window at Wall Macy's during, na during National Don't Do This to Yourself Awareness a Month. Fuck. Ah! Uh... Let me try that again, because that's a great line. His body showcases the cumulative effects of long hours, bad nutrition, too much booze, and not enough exercise. Like he's the display in the show window at Wall Macy's during National Don't Do This to Yourself Awareness Month. If Bollywood Central Casting had set out to produce a compendium of every stereotypical, fat, surly, burned-out, disheveled, inept, corrupt American flatfoot, Agent O'Brien would be that result down to four decimal places. I instantly don't like him. Lovely. Let's see some ID, special agents. They roll their eyes, grunt, sigh, and work in as many other nonverbal demonstrations of annoyance and put outedness as they can at the temerity of a citizen exercising his lawful right to require a law enforcement officer not to unif not in uniform to provide proof of identity. They take out their leather badge and ID holders, flip them open, flip them closed, and put them away. I wait for them to get comfortably settled. Sorry, special agents. That was too fast. Take them back out, lay them on the table, and let me get a good look at them. I wait for them to just start to bristle before I add, please. They repeat the whole theater of the annoyed performance as they redig out their IDs and lay them on the table. Agent O'Brien seethes with barely controlled fury as I read every word on his ID card and badge out loud, slowly and carefully, mispronouncing as many words as possible. Agent Reynolds twitches the corner of his mouth up at some inner amusement, gives me a slight nod and raises and raise of the eyebrow as I repeat the performance with his. All righty then, special agents. I'm willing to concede that you're probably who you say you are. How can I help you, gents? I ask, clasping, clasping my hands together on the table. Are you okay? Agent Reynolds asks, the younger of the two, probably not yet corrupt. Movie star features with green eyes, tan, buff, fit. He's in the wrong field. It's not often I use the term, handsome man. Okay in terms of what? in terms of your face. Have a difference of opinion with someone? Slipped in the shower, cut myself shaving, walked into a door, woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Something like that. Now, is this what you hear about, or can we move this little affair forward? Agent O'Brien bites, leaning on his elbows. 
The veteran's eyes meet mine, and he doesn't like what he sees. We're recording now, Mr. Hughes. Remember that. What are you recording with? I ask, just to be coy. Of course I can see the bee drone hovering behind the two men. I tip my hat to it, and I'm just about to flip at the bird when O'Brien smacks his gums. Probably not the bee drone you're acting the fool in front of, Mr. Hughes. Probably not the bee drone? Nothing like giving me a couple of snoop... Nothing like giving a couple of snoopers hell. It was something I did at least twice a week back when I was stuck in the loop. The NPC detectives never could take a joke. The sticks up their asses were prodigious in their length and stiffness. Look, Mr. Hughes, we just need your statement. This can be as easy and as civil as you want to make it. How do you want it? Polite and friendly, or difficult and unpleasant? Which would you prefer? I ask. Francis Euphoria enters with coffee. I blink my eyes shut and notice a red indicator flashing on my eyelids. My finger drops to my leg and I quickly scroll to the message. Francis. <clears throat> Francis. Behave yourself. Breakfast will be here soon. The badge thing was a scream, though. Me. I'm playing nice. Don't worry. Francis. Seriously. Behave. Francis sets the coffee down in front of me. Milk? Sugar? She asks the agents. No, thanks, grunts O'Brien. I take it just like I like my women. Hot, black, and not too sweet. Everybody who's not him rolls their eyes. Black for me, please, says Reynolds. I'll have some cre I'll have some cream, I tell her. She sets the coffees down in front of us, but somehow accident but somehow accidentally gives O'Brien the mixed Starbucks drive through treatment with his... Ah, uh, fuck. Damn it! Right after... Ah, uh, right where I'm turning the page. Okay. She sets the coffees down in front of us, but somehow accidentally gives O'Brien the mixed Starbucks... Fuck. She sets the coffees down in front of us, but somehow accidentally gives O'Brien the mixed Starbucks drive through treatment with his, right in his lap as he leers at... Fuck me. Still not right. This is like so... such an important line. She sets the coffees down in front of us, but somehow accidentally gives O... <laughs> Fuck. Fuck. But somehow accidentally gives O'Brien the mixed Starbucks drive through treatment with his, right in his lap as he leers at her. He curses, scrapes his chair back, grabs at his crotch to get the steaming hot wet spot away from his wedding tackle. Oh dear, I'm ever so sorry. How clumsy of me. I'll be right back with some paper towels. Francis gushes in patent insincerity. Francis gushes in patent insincerity. She never brings them. O'Brien gingerly reclaims his seat, and the agents continue once she's left. O'Brien's up to the plate again, trying his damnedest to hit a homer, dampened, danger dampened dangly bits and all. Fuck me, dude. I hate it when you have really good lines and I just can't get them out right. O'Brien is up to the plate again, trying his damnedest to hit a homer, dampened dangly bits and all. <sighs> so, you were in a dive vat when the men, Reapers. Reapers? Agent O'Brien gives his younger colleague the buddy punch as he laughs. <laughs> a little early for Halloween, don't you think? He finally says. They are field agents for the Revenue Corporation, I tell him. My eyes drop to my coffee watching the cream swirl and settle. What makes you think that? He asks. Think? I take a sip of my coffee. The cream has cooled it slightly, but it's still very hot. I know they work for the Revenue Corporation. There's no thinking involved. Do a little research and you'll get the picture. Reapers work in the Proxima Galaxy for the Revenue Corporation. They're techie bastards that hit a lick off of people trapped... 
that hit a lick. They're techie bastards that hit a lick off of people trapped in digital comas. They've done some vile, dirty, evil things, from imprisoning people in VE dream worlds to coming after them in real life, like they did me. We're not talking rocket science here, fellas. Put one and two together and get three. The evidence we've collected indicates that the suspects were simply trying to steal NV visors, haptic suits, any of the high-dollar VE gear from the digital coma ward. Nothing we have in any way even remotely linked them to the Revenue Corporation, Agent O'Brien says. Or Reapers. You actually expect me to believe that, Baloney? Do you actually believe that? I know that. We've already interviewed the suspects. Well, if I agreed with you, we'd both be wrong. Excuse me? Agent O'Brien asks, his jowls wobbling in irritation. Let me try that again. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't think I can I don't think I can do that and still talk. <laughs> oh man. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, okay. Any more, gents? Agent Reynolds asks. You killed one of the men in self-defense, did you not? No. I didn't kill anybody. The poor unfortunate tech thief got stunned and went face down in the vat goo. I tell Mr. Junior G-Man, thinking of the ponytailed button man I actually did drown. But I'm not going to fess that up to these schmoes. I did what I had to do. Anyone with a teaspoon of sense would have done the same thing. O'Brien picks up where he left off. Unfortunately, that's where your story differs from those of the two suspects we've got in custody. They claim that you attacked them before they could do anything. Now, it might have been self-defense at some point, but according to them, you're the one who started it. I almost snort coffee out of my nose, and I struggle mightily to not give them the satisfaction of seeing me do so. Their whole attitude is really starting to torque my jaws. Really? Really? Okay, I'm guessing that the FBI IG has to have a certain minimum intelligence standards, and I'm even willing to concede that the two of you probably sort of meet them. So you have to be aware of just how stupid that fatuous, lame-brained, dumbass statement makes you sound. I'd been floating in that vat in zero-g for eight years with all the bone mass loss and muscle tissue atrophy that that entails. I was so weak, I couldn't even pick my ass, never mind pick a fight. I couldn't lift a finger to defend myself when that guy held my face under to drown me. So number one, no, I didn't start anything. Number two, I didn't kill him. He was in the process of killing me. Number three, Tango Fox Bravo that he drowned. Tango Fox Bravo that he drowned while he was drowning me, but somehow I just can't get all boo-hoo over it. O'Brien looks to Agent Reynolds as his nostrils flare. No need to take that tone, Mr. Hughes. That's why we're here. So you can tell your story. Not a story. That's what happened. What about last night? O'Brien asks. Who started that fight then, huh? Last night? What's your angle? I thought this was about what happened in Cincinnati. It is. But according to the statement you gave Mark 9 Patrol Officer Unit 2315 last night, you started the fight. You took the first swing. I can play it back for you if you'd like. Last night? Yes, last night. Do you need me to refresh your memory? If you start a fight at a bar for no apparent reason, how are we supposed to believe that you weren't the one to initiate the attack back in the digital coma ward? How? He snarls. He ain't the only one who's peeved. You know, you really do put the special in special agent. Special Agent O'Brien. You're comparing pigs and poodles here. They both bristle at that as I take another swing swig from my cup of joe. 
Let me refer you to my previous statement about my physical incapacity when I woke up in the dive tank. Or do you need me to refresh your memory? I lean to the side and wave at the bee drone. Uh, I lean to the side and wave at the bee drone. Yoo-hoo! Hello! Still recording, right? And... And my condition was well documented in my medical records. So, that dog don't hunt. You got nothing, Elliot Ness. Drop it and move on. I'm standing, I'm standing now, way too angry to keep my seat, and I bang my cane on the floor to punctuate each point. He stands up, too. Yeah, I see your cane, he says. Poor crippled vet junkie. Poor crippled vat junkie. Well, don't expect any pity from me. You're like that because you choose to be that way. There are better ways to handle your condition now. A cane is a 20th century solution. If you've got problems getting around, get some replacement parts. Breathe in. Breathe out. That's not what I'm getting at, agents. What I'm guessing is this. Do you two really think a handicapped guy like me could take on those four guys? And look at what happened with the Guidos at the bar last night. I got in one swing with my cane, and then the big guy stuck it up my ass for me. You've got all the whoop video and Francis Euphoria's testimony. Are there any more questions, or can I get to work? Reynolds stands, opens a small metal box. The bee drone lands in it and shuts itself down. We'll be back. Agent, Agent O'Brien says as Reynolds pockets the bee drone box. We'll be back. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's that scene. All right, so now I want to move on to uh, uh, Steampunk Santa Claus, which is a great scene. I'm not sure. Do you remember? Uh, I only read them once. Old boy, 40. Uh, let's see. Harmon, do you remember what, what uh, chapter the Santa is in? Not chapter five. <laughs> That's Bobby's thing. Go sit, Francis. I'm starved. Oh man, I I really really love these books. Uh. So did I sound fat enough? By the way, did I sound fat enough for Adrian O'Brien? But his jowls, his jowls. It's very difficult to simulate jowls. In speech. Blah, blah, blah. Chapter 12. All right. I'm using the uh, the box set, so there's no there's no way to find chapters. Oh, yes, there are. Yes. Sweet. Cops. Nope, not, can't be chapter 12. No, that's definitely not it. 
Nope, that was... That's way past it. Fuck. Chapter 9? No. Doorman Jim... No, it's way before this. Seven. Breakfast burritos, the dive vat, Brian Enotone. Ah, here we go. All right, so... Uh, so... In... Steampunk is dead, obviously, they're in a steampunk Proxima world. And um, this is this is Quantum's first time in a new Proxima world outside of the Cyber Noir place. And uh, he's not used to... I mean, he, he's used to just being completely um, gung-ho, completely just shooting everyone that he feels like. And... Uh, <laughs> and... It's just, um, he, he's constantly getting them in trouble when they first start off. Um, by the way, there's a guy named Rocket. Yeah, uh, so, but I'm not actually going to be able to do his voice in this scene because he only, he only speaks through text to, to Quantum. Um, but his, his voice should be, I mean, it's, it should be kind of, um, uh, I, I don't know, I, I picture it as a little bit meek. Um, I actually, I see a, a particular actor in my head. Um, I don't remember his name, and I don't even remember, he, I don't remember his name even in the show that I see him in. Uh, the Blacklist, there's a, there's a tech guy, um, I don't know what his, what his, uh, what his race is. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I, I think maybe, um, he, he looks more Arab than anything, but, um, he's got like a, a soft, like kind of squirrely voice. Um, but not like, not all the way. It's, it's still got some substance to it. Uh, but that I, I've actually used that guy in another series before. Second generation Indian is what Harmon is saying for Rocket's character, um, but um, yeah, I don't I don't actually get to use his his name here. Oh, I definitely. It, uh, old boy asks, do you try to read the full book in one setting, or does it take seven days and a lot of several days and a lot of editing? Uh, yeah, it takes it takes several days. I mean, even these books these books are pretty short. And if I really tried, I think I could get one that, like, maybe Steampunk is Ed. I, I might be able to finish that in one sitting if I tried really fucking hard. But no, I wouldn't be able to get any editing done. It would just be all in the booth. It'd probably be... It'd be really fucking hard, and towards the end it would start sounding like shit because my voice would start deteriorating before I was done. But, no, there's no way. There's no way I'm actually going to do that, because I, I'm probably going to give each book, out of these two books, two, two days each. Um, we'll see. Anyway, so this is, I think this is their third time coming back into the Steampunk, uh, into Steam, the, it, which is the name of the actual uh, Proxima world, the actual Steampunk Proxima world that they're in. So, this is their third time coming back because they were they've been owned a few times. the 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 first couple times they got in trouble because of Quantum going buck wild. The player indicator potion appears. The player indicator potion appears in front of me, and I add it to my inventory list. Hello, item five hundred sixty three. One chug later, and I'm good to go. Why are the dames so much hotter than the guys in Steam? I ask. Did I say that right? Why are the dames so much hot? Why are the dames so much hotter than the guys in Steam? Nope. Why are the dames so much hotter than the guys in Steam? I ask. 
My indicator is green now. Twenty-one asking, I'm just a lowly NPC. Francis laughs. <laughs> what do you mean? Rocket. I changed your costumes. I changed your costumes, Q. Maybe this is their second time. Got it, Rocket, I say aloud. But my point remains. Why are the broads so much hotter than the guys? Francis Euphoria and I are in a makeshift bazaar situated around a giant fountain with clockwork cherubs astride mechanical dolphins spraying mist into the air. Her skirt is low-slung and dark violet, long in back, short in front, trimmed in black lace. Black leather garters secure thigh-high black and white striped stockings, pointed side-button shoes with studs and gears in case her tootsies. Her tatas spill over the top of the tightly laced hooded corset of the same shade and material like foam and a gliss like f <laughs> Let me see. This is awesome. Her tatas her tatas I I I this accent is making it hard to say tatas for some reason. Her tatas spill over the top of the tightly laced hooded corset of the same shade and material like foam in a pilsner glass. Black and white sleevelets that end in fingerless gloves cover her arms. Around her throat, she wears a white and salmon cameo on a black velvet ribbon, and a miniature bowler with two pheasant feathers perches atop her head. And, of course, leeks disguised as the ubiquitous heavy welding glass goggles. She's always been a choice bit of calico, the jammiest bit of jams. In her new get-up, she surpassed the cat's meow, upgrading to the kitty's roar. I... <laughs> Oh man, I such great costume descriptions in this book. I glance down at my own outfit. A striped overcoat with an ornately tooled leather shoulder rig on top of the jacket. A black leather cum cummerbund? A black leather cummerbund with See, I never knew how to spell that word or how to pronounce it properly. It's always been like just a word that I heard. A black leather cummerbund with sewn-in loops and topped off by little rivets. Black pants tucked into ankle, black pants tucked into ankle-high boots with embroidered stars on their sides. Nothing about this outfit. <laughs> Nothing about this outfit makes sense. Don't worry, you look cool, Francis says. True to Rocket's hack, her handle reads Steam Girl 889. She squeezes her fingers together, and the gears on her arm whir to life. The shotgun barrel lifts out of her arm and returns to its not-so-subtle docking station. Cool? Are you still drunk? I kind of like Steam Quantum better than Loop Quantum. Eh. I kind of like Steam Quantum better than Loop Quantum. Keep it up, Francis. Rocket. Would you like a mask? No, Atlas, I don't want a mask. I just want... I want to look like a guy who means business, not a guy on his way to a gothic Halloween party. Rocket. Okay, no cummerbund next time. I equip my wrist gun, item 560, which attaches itself to the gear on my right wrist. The sound of gears shifting indicates that it's ready. Aiming my arm in front of me, I fire a pretend shot at a smokestack in the distance. The two moons sitting in the air behind the smokestack gets me wondering. Is it always night here? It's always dusk here, Francis says. Everything in this world is about the mood, the setting. It's only light enough to cast some shadows. And it's like this everywhere? Rocket. Actually, Francis is wrong. It's only like this around Locus. I point at the airship floating over one of the mountains on the outskirts of the city. Planes like wood and canvas dragonfly. Planes like wood and canvas dragonflies move to and from the airship. Enormous pipes, big enough to be visible from where we stand, protrude from the mountain, fill the air with thick clouds of steam which roll over the city like an ominous mist. So we need to get up there? That's where Ray Steampunk is, Francis says. Rocket. I asked around last night. You need to get to the airship and from there to his inner chamber. 
He is said to have enormous steam enforcers protecting him. Be ready for anything. Let me see, let me see. Okay. Yeah, they hide, okay. Air bleeds from crossover ducts that weave in and out of the buildings surrounding the streets and large temperature gauges alternate on... Air bleeds from crossover ducts that weave in and out of the buildings surrounding the streets, and large temperature gauges alternate on the street corners. On the street corners, fuck. And large temperature gauges alternate on the street corners. Francis Euphoria and I pass Victorian clothing shops, gear repairmen, and a... Francis Euphoria and I pass Victorian clothing shops, gear repairmen, and a guy hawking top hats. A vehicle rattles by, its engine exposed and its pistons pumping up and down, releasing hot air with each movement. A haymaker if I ever saw one. A haymaker if I ever saw one. A haymaker if I ever saw one. It's followed by a steam-powered motorcycle, coughing up exhaust like a lifelong two-pack a day -er. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Reapers are here! Reapers are here! A boy in a cream shirt tucked into a pair of trousers shouts into a cone. He's on a crate in front of a newspaper stand, wearing a bowler hat with goggles resting on its brim. Read all about it! Reapers are here! They sell newspapers in steam? Francis nods. Everything here is done for a reason. To enhance the experience of the end user. I'll take one, I tell the little twerp. Rapists? What? One shilling, please, he says. Francis? I ask. She opens a little pouch on her belt and retrieves a coin. This is so strange, I say as I crack open the paper. I've never read a newspaper in a digital world before. There's just something wrong about it. I finished the entire Dune series and the knockoffs and the fanfic when I was trapped in Arrakis. Twice. How meta, I tell her as I scan the headlines. Excuse me. <laughs> ah, here we are. I turn the paper to Francis, showing, showing her our sepia-toned, woodcut-style portraiture from yesterday. It's a good thing I was wearing the skull mask. You, on the other hand... Francis's hair changes from red to blonde. Better... The newspaper boy points to the sky, and I follow his finger to something moving through the air. What is it? I ask. He looks at me incredulously. You've never seen that before? No, I say. We are... new NPCs. Just generated. The little crumb snatcher gives me a funny look. They're air enforcers. An explosion about a hundred meters away rumbles the ground. With my sorry, I keep getting I keep getting distracted by the chat and I shouldn't be. It's unprofessional. Here we go. I need to get the other I I haven't been uh, using the chat on my iPad, which is better actually. Cuz then I can go back. Scroll back. It's easier. An explosion about a hundred meters away rumbles the ground. With my advanced abilities bar activated, the world moves like molasses around me and I aim my wrist gun in the direction of the explosion. I hold off firing when I see a pair of reapers rip through the explosion riding steam-powered motorcycles. Reapers. Their bodies clad in Lee Mouton road warrior leather and fantasy Viking wear. Their muscles inflated, their masks deformed skulls. I'm just about to fire at them when Francis grabs my firing arm and jolts me out of advanced abilities. What? I ask, catching my balance. The Reapers are getting away! My finger comes up so I can equip my mutant hack. Quantum! Francis kicks my feet out from under me and lands on top of me just as an air enforcer sails over us. His canvas wings spread wide as he controls his craft through joysticks attached to his harness. He's followed by three more enforcers, two male and one female. They wear matching leather aviator helmets with flaps that extend over their ears. Their eyes are covered by goggles. The blue indicators show they're human. 
Their slipstream scatters the newspapers into the air. The newsboy cries out in dismay and chagrin. Puffs of steam trail behind the air enforcers as they continue their pursuit. We need to get in on this, I say on my feet again. More are com- More are coming, the newsboy shouts. The newsboy shouts. He leaps up and pulls down a slatted wooden covering for his newspaper kiosk. He's gone in a flash, logged out. Oh, he's a player. A squadron of air enforcers zips, up o zips over us, causing a small tornado. This way, Frances says, squeezing my hand tightly. Her blonde ponytail is lashing against her face, her skirt billows against her admittedly shapely legs as she leads me through the windstorm caused by the air enforcers. Her shoulder hits a large wooden door. We tumble in, followed by shrapnel-like debris and loose newspapers. I slam the door shut behind me and fall onto my rump, laughing. <laughs> that was crazy, I say, my back to the door. Excuse me, the shop owner says curtly. I trust that the two of you are prepared to make a purchase after that rather boorish entrance. My next question comes naturally. You don't happen to have an air enforcer set up, do you? Something to fly with? I stand up dust off my striped da jacket, and make sure everything is in working order. Frances does the same, straightens her skirt, and adjusts her boobage. A black cat curves through my legs, making very uncat-like chicken clucking noises. Why would an NPC want air enforcer gear? The shop owner asks with a twinkle in his eyes. He has a tremendous Billy F. Gibbons white beard that goes all the way down to his stomach and is stylishly curled at the ends. He wears a red frock coat over a pearl gray vest. The golden watch chain is a nice touch, shows that he pays attention to detail. Who doesn't want to fly around and see the sights? I ask. The cat rubs around my ankles and clucks like a chicken some more. I reach down and run my fingers through its silky coat which it seems to like. Aha! Uh -huh. You're using a potion to mask your player indicators, the shop owner says. This makes me wonder if your names really are Steamboy889 and Steamgirl889, which, to not put too fine a point on it, are pretty darn stupid and solidly lacking in the originality department. Rocket. They're not that stupid. Look, pal, I say, as the gears were on my wrist gun. Quantum? Cool it, Francis. I keep my firing arm aimed at the shop owner. A, sh a short fuse this one has, the shop owner says, chuckling. <laughs> now see here, quick draw. I don't care if you're masking your identity or not. That's your business. I couldn't be less interested. However... You barge into my shop the way you just did. You buy something. That strikes me as a relatively simple and straightforward business proposition. Does it strike you that way as well? Or do you perhaps require some convincing? The man taps his toe on the floor, and I hear the sound of grinding machinery as a panel above and behind him sli slides open to reveal a cannon-sized barrel pointing directly at us. Nice one, Quantum, says Steam Girl 889. Way to make friends and influence people. Allow me to showcase my patented efficacious exothermic enthalopat uh, efficacious exothermic enthalop enthal enthal enthalaptic. Okay. Efficacious exothermic enthalaptic Allow me to showcase my patented efficacious exothermic enthalaptic equilibriator. It will freeze you solid faster than a fish can fart, says the, says the proprietor. Does sir wish a first-hand demonstration of its efficiency? Freeze solid? How's that even possible? Rocket, it's possible because of steam. Now's not a good time, Big R. I await your definitive answer. 
he prompts as he twists the end of his white beard. Inquiring minds want to know. I look to Francis. No, don't need a demonstration. You? Uh, sometimes I do. Sometimes I am clapping, so... Which I don't do while I'm recording, but I just let myself go for the stream, so... <laughs> oh my god, I love the chat. A rime of frost forms at the muzzle of the freeze cannon, slowly creeping its way rearward. She shakes her head. I'm good. Frozen solid is pretty darned unpleasant, especially transmitted through an NV visor. All right, all right, I say. I put up my wrist gun and reach for the sky. We'll buy something. Excellent! The shop owner claps his hands and the ice cannon returns to its docking port in the ceiling. He is around the counter moments later, a grin writ large across his fizzog. What do you sell exactly? Francis asks. What do I sell exactly? He laughs. <laughs> I sell the things that dreams are made of. I sell exactly what a pair of marauders like the two of you need. We aren't marauders, I tell him. Yes, we are, Francis says under her breath. The man moves past us now, beckoning us forward. Of course you're not marauders. How presumptuous of me to have thought so. Right this way, right this way. He stops at the corner of the room in front of a series of polished brass speaking tubes that could have come from the bridge of the Britannic. He selects one, flips open its cover, and shouts, Visitors! We have visitors! Lower us to, lower us to basement two, Chacho! Pronto! A voice comes out of a pipe affixed to the ceiling. Uh, I can't... I can't remember what Chacho is supposed to sound like. Who's Chacho again? Is he a monkey? What the fuck? Give me some direction for Chacho. Sleepy, okay. I'm sleeping. You can't be sleeping if you're speaking to me, Chocho. Wakey, wakey, hands off, snakey. I don't pay you to sleep. Pay? Huh. Come, come, the shop owner says as Francis and I approach him cautious, cautiously. Good. Stand right there. And you stand right there, my fine young miss. He points at a circular... He points at a circular platform about nine feet across. The cat hops on the platform and he picks it up, hugs it, rubs his cheek against its head. There's my good puss. I know you think it's just right for cats, but I'm afraid you can't come, chicken, he says. The cat's name is Chicken, I ask. He grins. You've heard how she communicates. One couldn't very well eclipse her with a moniker like Flipper or Trowel Falls. I don't get that. I don't get that reference, sorry. Rocket. Why would he want to clip her with a harmonica? Now's not good, Peanut Gallery. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got caught up in that because I was like, what the fuck does that mean? Chacho's, Chacho's voice comes from the ceiling. Good to go. All aboard! The bearded shop owner, the bearded shop owner places the cat on the floor just outside the platform. Ready? He asks. Do we have a choice? Why, certainly, my good fellow, there's always a choice, he says with a disarming grin and a cheerful tone. You can continue your passive-aggressive bullshit, in which case I'll freeze you solid and display you outside as a particularly festive snow homunculus, or you can keep your festering gob closed and avail yourself of my services. The latter will be just fine, Francis says for me. The circular platform drops, leaving the ground floor of the shop behind. The light fades as we descend, and Francis's hand hooks around my arm. Ah, yes! Our aleurophiliac? 
what is this word? Aleurophiliac. I, I gotta look it up. Can't help it. It's in the Urban Dictionary. Okay. An individual who loves cats. Got it. Ah, oh, yes! Our Aleurophiliac host exclaims as the platform comes to a stop. Here we are! My charming young... Here we are, my charming young lovebirds! One glance up and I see Chicken, the... One glance up and I see Chicken, the cat's eyes reflecting in the half-light as she peers down at us. <laughs> it's in the Urban Dictionary, so... I guess, uh... I guess you learn that from black people, right? <laughs> Isn't that... <laughs> Hanging around black people too much. They all say all these crazy words like aleurophiliac. <laughs> it still says a dictionary. All right. So... I don't know, I kind of want to keep going, but I don't want to spoil the scene anymore. Because this is like his only scene. Okay, so... <laughs> let's go ahead and do one more scene. Um, let's see, Harmon, are there any other characters that you want to hear? I mean, we've done almost all of them from uh, Steampunk is Dead, I think. Uh, let's see. I guess you'd need to hear, uh, Roy Steampunk. If you want to, or... <clears throat> okay, nothing new in Steampunk is Dead. Do you want me to do something like the first chapter of High Fantasy? Ray Steampunk. Okay, he wants me to do a mad action scene, so this is chapter one of High Fantasy. <clears throat> chapter one. Aiden is in a basketball jersey with the initials M.A. across his back. In his left hand is his Wall Macy's net shopping. In his left hand is his Wall Macy's net shopping bag full of cactus, and across his chest are ten horseshoes held to his body by a leather belt. A fly swatter is tough. <laughs> what? Hold on. <laughs> Let me start this over. Aiden is in a basketball jersey with the initials M A across his back. In his left hand is his Wall Macy's net shopping bag full of cactus, and across his chest are ten horseshoes held to his body by a leather belt. A fly swatter is tucked into the front of his basketball shorts alongside a pair of rusty gardening shears. <laughs> Do you see Tony? He asks me, roller skating in a circle. <laughs> I uh, sorry, I haven't I haven't I haven't read <laughs> I haven't read this one yet. So <laughs> this is all coming as a surprise to me. He wears a pair of vintage roller skates with leather uppers and hardened toes. Cold BBs of rain soak our clothes and pockets of lightning add shadow to our faces. On my knees, I again glance down through the rooftop skylight at the card game below. My reaper skull Item 551 allows me to see the grid lines that make up the loop. I can also see NPCs, although their names aren't displayed. What's he look like again? Fat, lots of hair, big sunglasses, little mustache. Tony Clifton was a new crime boss who had partnered up with Chinatown Scarface Charlie. 
Pushing riotous through greasy food joints and massage parlors was his M.O. Concreting people's feet was his favorite pastime. He wasn't as bad as Charlie, not the type to use a head crusher on a first date, but if there's anything I've learned in the loop, it is this. The good get bad, and the bad get worse. Here comes the Godfather now. How many, Quantum? Eight, including the big cheese. My ocular feed shows a man with a distended belly entering the room. His greased-up cowlick and the outline of his sunglasses confirms it. This is our man. My skull mask dematerializes as it returns to my My skull mask dematerializes as it returns to my inventory list. I place my boxing glove on my hand, item 32, and twist the handle on my antique selfie stick, item 99. <laughs> 53, my football pads add some bulk to my frame as does my vintage Bengals football helmet. Item 270, 271. Just in case I need to slice and dice, item 40, my serrated elephant tusk, hangs from a loop on my belt. That reminds me. My inventory list comes up and I scroll to item 273. Cleats with metal spikes. They appear on my feet, lace themselves up. Remember. Uh, remember, I tell Aiden. No conventional weapons. If you die, do not respawn. That's the only rule. Got it, he says with a wolfish grin. <sighs> okay, wait a second. You... You based Tony Clifton... Off... Okay, is this just gonna be an image? Okay. <laughs> okay. Our non-conventional weapons rule means that we can't blow through the ceiling as we normally would. Luckily, Aiden has already worked his way around this self-imposed restriction. Just leap over, just leap over holding on to this, he tells me as he fastens the ro rope to a rooftop air conditioner unit. Excuse me. Activate your advanced abilities and rocket through the window. I'll hit the other side at the same time. Nothing to it. Don't kill Tony, I remind him. Same to you. Excuse me. I jam my selfie stick in my belt, keeping my boxing glove on my right hand. I'm on the edge of the rooftop seconds later, holding the rope with one hand and waiting for Aiden's signal. The cold rain picks up and runs into my eyes. Come on, Dolly, lighten up, will ya? I ask the sky. The rain stops completely, but the clouds stay dark. Thanks, doll. Aiden's finger comes up and he twists, in the, twists it in the air like a mini lasso. Pushing off the ledge, I shoot out over the rooftop and I activate my advanced abilities bar, giving me both the juice and the ability to violate the Einsteinian space-time continuum. Cleats, cleats plus glass equals Shattersville. I land in the room and roll out, brandishing my selfie stick. One of the button men watching the card game goes for his gat, but I reenact the caning of... <laughs> One of the button men watching the card game goes for his gat, but I reenact the caning of Senator Charles Sumner and he drops like 200 pounds of bad habit in a cheap suit. I give his face the cube steak treatment as I dance a flamenco a la cleats with my selfie stick clenched between my teeth. Olé! <laughs> a ferret-faced, greasy little weasel of a man is somewhat faster than his card-playing buddies, and even in slow-mo gets his forty-five out and pointed right at my heart, just as Aiden frisbees a horseshoe into the back of his head. Holy horseshoe headache, Batman. Mr. M Damn it, Mus Mustelidae. Mustelidae? Okay. It's, it's, it's a carnivorous weasel. Mr. Mustilidae's, 
Mr. Mustilla Die's secret Mustilla Dyer Day. Mr. Mustilla Day's cigarette chewing. Mr. Mustilla Day's cigarette, chewing gum, and toothpick fly out of his mouth as he hits the table and scatters the chips, but he maintains a death grip on his cards. And no wonder, he's holding a royal flush. <laughs> this is so fucking awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry to see a good hand wasted like that, but I've got more important things to deal with at the moment. <laughs> I give the next Goomba a little Joe Frazier and think about throwing in a little... M <laughs> I give the next Goomba a little Joe Frazier and think about throwing in a little Tyson Holyfield 2 action when I'm whacked from behind with a crowbar. Stars, planets, and Tweety Birds circle my head. My ears ring, my nose runs, and I release a cloud of flatus as the ghost of Neil deGrasse Tyson laughs and points. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> my life bar drops by 25%, and I can't make my hands or feet obey my commands as I reel forward from the blow. Aiden to the rescue with a pair of flying horseshoes, which catch the crowbar swinging no good nick right in the cake hole and lodge there like a pair of politically incorrect cartoon ubang ubangi oh, <laughs> and lodge there like a pair of politically incorrect cartoon ubangi lip plates. He ne <laughs> <laughs> he keels over backwards, and I shake off the effects of his rolled steel love tap. He keels over backwards, and I shake off the effects of his rolled steel love tap. I drop my AA bar for a moment to sink a ri hard right into the beezer of the chubby-cheeked Shylock just getting a grip on his gun. He squeezes the trigger in response and fires the round out the side of his jacket and into Tony Clifton's foot, who screams like the lunch whistle at the Big Sissy Manufacturing Company. <laughs> My finger comes up in a pot of lawsuit temperature mixed Starbucks Ultra Calf Cap Espresso, item 9, materializes in my other hand. A flick of my wrist and the overpriced hipster tri <laughs> A flick of my wrist and the overpriced hipster tipple hipster tipple parboils. A flick of my wrist and the overpriced hipster tipple parboils another black-suited palooka's wedding tackle, like a wheeled Tony, like a wheeled Tanya Harding Galuli. A <laughs> what? Like a wheeled Tanya Harding Galuli, Aiden launches into a triple axle and snaps his shopping bag. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> Let me try that again. Like a wheeled Tanya Harding Galuli, Aiden launches into a triple axle and snaps his shopping bag of cactus straight into the man's already uncomfortable nether region. The brawny bruiser falls to his knees, face plants, and twitches spasmodically. Advanced Abilities Redux I charge forward and put my football-helmeted head right in the breadbasket of the zoot-suited trigger man nearest the door. He folds in the middle and his spine snaps like a breadstick as I knock him right out of his pointy-toed sharkskin shoes and neat little pork pie hat. I can almost see the ref throw the yellow flag like they used to win. I can almost see the ref throw the yellow flag like they used to when football still had rules. Bullets break the sound barrier above me. I drop my selfie stick and get a firm grip on my serrated elephant tusk. I'm just about to engage in some antique ivory slicage and dicage when somebody's copper-jacketed hate mail connects with my shoulder, spins me around, and knocks my life bar down another ten percent. I turn to see Aiden use his garden shears like a gladius on the trigger man who just ruined a perfectly good pair of vintage football shoulder pads. Fuck, man. <sighs> Let me try that again. This is tough. <clears throat> I turn to see Aiden use his garden shears like a gladius on the trigger man who just ruined a perfectly good pair of vintage football shoulder pads. I take this moment to do a little sawing on the man's throat beneath me. 
Saw, saw, saw goes the saw, and bleed, bleed, bleed goes the throat, and I'm done before the nursery rhyme can finish. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, you got me. I don't know. That sounds like that sounds like O'Brien, doesn't it? All right, all right, you got me. Tony Clifton has his hands in the air now. Aiden is behind him, the tip of his fly swatter pressed into the Godfather's ear. It's a shiv? I ask. The mobster beneath me coughs, causing the gaping wound on his neck to bleed out even more. Yeah, Aiden says. I thought you knew. A shiv is a conventional weapon. Is it? You know, the serrated elephant tusk could also be considered a conventional weapon. A caddish. Okay, I don't know what this means. Caddish Coogin? Uh, eventually, eventually, Sin, I will be able to. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a lot of bloopers on this one if you want to watch the replay. Okay, Coogin. Okay, so it's like a cousin. It, it's cousin in Italian. How do I how do I pronounce that? Nope, that's not it. All right, let's go with Forvo. It only gives me Cugini. So Cugini. Okay, let me try this again. Caddish. And what is, I guess, like a cad? A caddish coogene near one of the smashed windows coughs. The man tries to stand, tumbles forward in a slump as his digital ghost exits his body. Tony Clifton barks, You two ain't getting away with this! This is Scarface, Char this is Scarface Charlie's territory! I know people. Looks like everyone you know is either dead or dying, I say as I approach the top banana. I say as I approach the top banana. Tony tries to move. Aiden responds by pressing the sharpened end of the fly swatter deeper into the head honcho's ear hole. What's the big idea, Mac? You trying to poke my brain or something? I use my elephant tusk to lift his chin so that Tony's looking right at me with his big brown eyes. I'm only going to ask you this once. Where's Dirty Dave? That slime ball! You come here for scum like that? Tell him what he wants to know, Aiden says. Otherwise, you'll be taking a trip to the... What's the word for an ear doctor? An otoler... An otoler... An o... O an otolaring o o otolaring Jesus Christ you're making me look up words this whole time <laughs> uh come on There's 
snow pronunciation. <laughs> oh, man. All right. I just checked a dictionary. There's no pr that there's usually a pronunciation for, and it's not there. Here we go. Here we go. Found something on on uh, on YouTube. Oh, to laryngologist. I should have known. An otolaryngologist. O T A O T O L A R Y N G O L O G I S T. An O T an O T O L A R Y N G O L O G I S T. Oh fuck me. An O T an O T O L A R Y N G O L O G I S T. An O T O L A R Y N G O L O G I S T. O T O L A R Y N G O L O G I S T. An O T O L A R Y N G O L O G I S T. Tony says matter-of-factly. I see mine regularly. You should too. I'll look into it. I'll look into it. That's great. I tell both of them, but we ain't here for a checkup. Where's Dirty Dave? That cafone owes me money. He gr that cafone owes me money. He growls. A vein appears on the side of his head. How much does he owe you? More credit than you got. Aiden gets my drift and steps back, allowing me to sink a fist into the boss man's schnozzle. Dirty Dave, I say as blood trickles out of his nose. Tell us where he is or you'll... What do you mafia types say? Sleep with the fishes? I'll give you a new pair of concrete disc Nikes and toss you off the pier. Tell us where he is and I won't kill you. How's that sound? Dis Nikes? What's the first half of that? Dis Nikes. Dis. I don't know. I don't know what, what that brand would be. I feel dumb. Disney. Okay. Diz Nikes. <laughs> Disney Nike, gotcha. I see I wasn't even I was just thinking of different uh different shoe brands. He curls his lips, weighs his options. There are some real hungry fish at the pier. No, there are some real hungry fish at the pier, I tell him. Piranhas too. You got options here, Tony. I'm the one that put those piranhas there, he admits, and you're right. They are hungry. I don't know why you're so interested in that babu. We have our reasons, I tell him. Dirty Dave is here in Chinatown, practically under your shoes. No shit, Sherlock, but where in Chinatown? Aiden gives Gotti... <laughs> Aiden gives Gotti Light a quick rabbit punch with his free hand. What the hell was that for? Hurry up. Relax already, Tony says. I'm talking, ain't I? Not... Not fast enough. I tell the bloody kingpin. Chinese grocery. Up the street. You got him in the freezer? Yeah, he tells me, hanging from a meat hook like the carcass that he is. Good. Thanks, Tony, I say. Do what you gotta do, Aiden. Can I borrow your elephant tusk? He asks. Not a problem. I drop the tusk on the table and turn to the door. You said you wouldn't kill me! Tony shouts, spittle spraying from his mouth. I won't, I say over my shoulder. He will. All right, so uh, that that's probably gonna have to be it for tonight. We've gone an hour and a half, uh, but yeah, that was one of the most fun scenes ever. Uh, so I, does it say later on in this chapter why they had to not do the conventional weaponry? Was it just something they did for fun? You don't have to answer that, people can find out when they listen um so yeah i'm gonna be recording both of these back to back steampunk is dead and high fantasy uh <clears throat> and um let's see we're actually going to be putting all three of them into a bundle the first three and so you'll be able to listen to you'll be able to use one credit for the all three books in the first in all three of the first books in the series. So, 
So if you're if you've already got the first book, you're still saving money if you get the second one through uh, through through the bundle. If you haven't listened to the first one, just wait. Wait till uh, these two come out. And you can still get them singly if you want, you know, if you like to collect stuff or if you just want the if you just I, I don't know, it's a little bit more organized that way. You get all the covers. So uh yeah. So much fun, guys. I can't wait to get started recording this. I'm going to get started recording this tomorrow. I still have to finish up Unde- Unbound Death Lord. Uh, I had some hiccups in the like the first two days of this week. Some things that really uh, stopped me from a re- recording and put me behind. But book two for Unbound Death Lord is not finished yet. It was supposed to be. Um, I scheduled these these three weeks to do Unbound Death Lord one and two, but since book two is not finished, um, I get to get started on this early. So uh, and, and then. Delvers 2 will be next week. I'm, I'm going to do next Wednesday. I'm going to have Blaze on and we're going to work out whatever new characters that are there in Delvers 2 and um, find the fun scenes to narrate. So come back for that. Uh, anyone who did anyone request any audiobooks? I don't think so. I really should re- remind people every once in a while uh, to request one, but too late. You guys are too late. Um, uh, next time I'll be like every 20 minutes. Oh yeah, by the way guys, if you want a free audiobook, say something in the chat. Request it in the chat. Uh, but anyway, thanks for thanks for hanging out with me and Harmon and everybody else who's a regular viewer. This Sunday I'll be doing another request only of Sound Booth Theater Live, but I'm also going to be doing uh, so now there's going to be two specific segments, and I'll make I'll make actual text and graphics for them for next time, and uh, like a script that I can read for what each segment is. Uh, but I think I'm going to do well. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but there's a new segment for my Sunday shows called the classics. So I'm going to pick some kind of classic literature to read from. Um, and then also Cringe Theater at the end, I'm going to continue Katy Perry vs. Jason by Kitty Glitter, which is amazing. It's so amazing. If you haven't watched the first half of that, you can see it on the last replay that I have, uh, the Sound Booth Theater Live for April 30th. The Cringe Theater on there is the first half of Katy Perry vs. Jason and it's glorious, so definitely go check that out. If you like the bloopers here, holy shit. Um, so have fun, guys. Uh, thanks thanks so much for, for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you Sunday. And also go buy the feedback loop. If, you, if, you're, if you're too impatient to wait for the bundle to come out, the first one is already available on Audible. So there it is.